This is Report to Wyoming. This show targets local issues that matter right here in Natrona County, where we talk to real people about their thoughts and ideas. For this week's episode, I'm talking to Rachel Bailey about food insecurity in Wyoming and the work she's doing through the state's food bank to help out with the problem. I am the executive director of the Food Bank of Wyoming. And when did you get started doing this? So I have been in my position at the Food Bank of Wyoming for almost a year. I started last May 2022. Oh, what did you jump from something else? I did. So I've been involved in the nonprofit community in Casper for over t- 10 years now. And um, previously, I was at the Wyoming Symphony Orchestra. So I traded uh, nourishing souls for nourishing bellies. Oh, I like it. Okay. And f- I was going to say food. Why did food draw you in? Or did food draw you in? <laughs> you know, I was looking for a new challenge. And I definitely found it at the Food Bank of Wyoming. It is a, it's a larger organization. It's a state-run organization. So we serve all 23 counties in Wyoming. And, you know, food has always been a big part of my life. Um, it's been a b- big part of um, my family and, and, and how we interact with each other. And I have traveled a lot um, around the world. And I have observed how in other cultures there is Uh, food insecurity. And, you know, realizing after you look around a little bit here that there's food insecurity right here in our own backyard. Um, And it's just something I think that, you know, a lot of the a lot of my focus um, since I returned home about 13 years ago is building um, or helping to build healthy and vibrant communities in Wyoming. And I think that, um, you know, food is one of the most important things that people need. I mean, it's a basic need, but also um, how can you be a contributing member to a community um, if you don't have enough nourishment? So I wonder how much our climate um, plays into this. I would imagine it does. You know, I mean, I Wyoming is a, has has its own very unique challenges in trying to distribute food across the state. And one of those unique challenges is that, you know, we don't grow a lot of food for humans in Wyoming. We grow a lot of food for uh, cattle and sheep, um, but we don't grow a lot of food for humans. And, you know, part of the reason of that is because of our climate, our soil. Um, we have a very short growing season. Um, so, you know, that is something I do feel is changing and evolving like very slowly with the advent of there's a lot of um, community gardens and greenhouses that have popped up and there's a real emphasis on food sovereignty and, you know, kind of things like that. But, you know, we're never going to be a Palisades, Colorado, or we're never going to be a California or Florida um, where a lot of growing happens. So, yeah, it could contribute to that. And so when we're growing the food for the animals, one might argue that then we are still growing food for our bellies because we are cows, meat, mm-hmm. all of that. But in terms of vegetables and fruits, it might even be something of a food desert. And so it's definitely improved a lot. I know I'm going to talk to Jamie Purcell about the status of a co-op down the road. But yeah, it's, it's going to be harder. And personally, I know just growing, trying to grow my own herbs and vegetables in the summertime, it's such a short window that you have and the yield... Well, I haven't been terribly successful, but I go to the farmer's markets and some people are doing a lot better than me with that. Oh, and the advent of farmer's markets um, has been incredible. I also go to the farmer's market and I also receive a um, I receive a box of food every month um, through Eat Wyoming, which is really great. And it's grown here in Wyoming and able to support um, uh, Wyoming growers. And, um, you know, and I think that anything that we can do to encourage those things um, will be better off for all of the communities across the state. Um, and, you know, back to saying that Wyoming is a, is a food desert. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it can be very much. Because of the rural nature of the state and the long distances in between communities and because of the rural nature of communities, um, you know, some communities only have a convenience store and that's what they have, um, you know, to where to access food. And if you don't have the ability to drive long distances, um, if you can't afford that um, or if you don't have the transportation, then it can be very challenging getting food um, right. in the state. Yeah. My twin sister lives over in Sublette County, and at least once a month, they make a big trip to the nearest Walmart, which is two hours away in Rock Springs. Mm -hmm. And so you get your giant, you know, fill up as much as she can in her vehicle, basically, and then 
comes home. But otherwise, you shop at the local stores like Bernie's. Shout out mm-hmm. Big Biney. Um, but <laughs> it's more expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't have a lot of variety. They could drive. Jackson is a little bit closer, Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes the roads are so bad in the winter that you don't want to risk it. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I'd say that, um, you know, uh, cost, transportation, um, you know, weather, you know, all of those things are barriers to, can be barriers to food access for some people in Wyoming. I got a press release a few weeks ago about the elderly community and the need there is for them here in Casper. Can you speak to kind of what we're looking at numbers wise, the volume of hunger, if you will? No. Okay. (laughs) So let's go. Let's do it this way. Okay. Okay. So so according to U.S. Census data and a Feeding America, like a large national Feeding America study, about 11% of Wyomingites suffer from food insecurity. Okay. So it's okay. roughly about 61,000 people okay. across the state. So, I mean, you know, this it's a, it's a pretty sizable portion of our population. And within that, you know, um, there's no age discrimination to food insecurity. So, you know, that covers um, kids, you know, young adults, adults, and then older adults. There is a larger population of older adults that can suffer from food insecurity because a lot of them are on fixed incomes. So, and when that income is not flexible, then when you have things like inflation or you have a health event or your car breaks down, things like that, then what sometimes then does become more flexible is your food budget. And, you know, and when we talk about food insecurity, um, food insecurity is not necessarily being hungry. Uh, Food insecurity is defined as a lack, a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. So so a lot of people are not necessarily food insecure all the time, um, but they can have events in their life where they become food insecure. And so, you know, what does that look like? That means that, you know, you go to the store and because you have maybe a more limited budget, your food budget is more flexible. And so maybe you're going to choose less nutritious food um, because it's cheaper, or maybe you're going to skip a meal altogether. So that is where, you know, food insecurity differs a little bit from hunger, you know, because hunger is is actually a personal physical sensation of discomfort. And then again, food insecurity re- refers to a lack of available financial um, resources for food at the household level. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's why, you know, I mean, again, back to um, all ages of folks in Wyoming may suffer from food insecurity, but we do see it in um, older adults because they can be on more fixed or inflexible income. And I see how this differs um, from something like governmental like SNAP, right? That's giving people, um, I don't if it's a card or food stamps is kind of what a lot of people might think of in their head, but something where they can go and get... Um, some free products, but it's going to be the really processed prepackaged foods typically. There's only mm-hmm. so much that you get for produce, and I don't know about meat or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I have to have someone to speak more to that, but this is where you guys differentiate yourselves largely, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, SNAP is also a very important. Um, program that is um, helping people that are food insecure in the state. It's run through the Department of Family Sur- um, sorry, the Department of Family Services. Um, but you know the thing that everybody needs to, to think about is that it's a supplemental income. It's not paying for somebody's entire grocery bill every month. So you know some people that might be on SNAP benefits, they might also need to visit their local food pantry or soup kitchen. Um, you know, and again, it's it's you know there are a lot of people that food insecurity can be an event in their life. It's not always that way, um, but isn't it wonderful that we have the resources in Wyoming and the um, the communities and these organizations that really care, you know, to help people out when they are in need, um, so that they can get a leg up and um, you know hopefully get to a, a better financial place. And so, as far as what you guys do, you're. Um, you're not a soup kitchen, you're not a pantry, you're not providing funds for um, them to go get food. What specifically are you guys doing to help with food insecurity? 
So food, the Food Bank of Wyoming is, um, we are the largest distribution center. Um, and we're the largest distributor of what we call like emergency foods or, you know, foods to those in need across the state. So we serve all 23 counties. And um, we've been addressing food insecurity in um, out of our Casper Distribution Center for about 20 years. And what how we do this is we provide food and necessities to people in need um, through um, we have signature programs that directly serve food to people. And then um, we also team up with hunger relief partners across the state. Okay, so we have about 150 hunger relief partners across the state. And last year, we distributed about 9.9 million pounds of food through those partners. First of all, let's talk about where does this food come from, right? Um, Because the food comes from several different sources. So it's a combination of both donated and purchased food items. Food is donated to us by national and regional manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. For instance, one of our biggest uh, donors right now is the Walmart Distribution Center outside of Cheyenne. So I don't know if you've ever driven by there, but it's absolutely massive. And, um, you know, it is the place, it's the distribution center for all of the Walmarts in the area. And so we get, you know, uh, food items that maybe they were slightly damaged or uh, maybe they, they're coming to the end of their shelf life. So it's, it doesn't seem um, like if they distribute it to another store, then maybe it would come to the end of its life more quickly, you know, kind of things like that. So it's perfectly great food. Um, it's, it's perfectly safe food. Um, and so we then it's delivered to our distribution center and then we then deliver it across the state um, in our trucks. We also provide a cooperative buying service, which augments that donated product. So because we are part of a much larger food banking network through Feeding America, we are able to purchase food in bulk, which allows our dollars to go so much further than like if you were to buy it at the grocery store. So in fact, like about $1 equals three meals. So that's kind of the purchasing power that we have, um, you know, with this with this national network. So partner agencies are are able to, you know, go into a system. Uh, it's a web-based system. They're able to select the donated product that they want, and then they're also um, able to select purchase product, and then um, they reimburse us for that purchase product at about the same price that we that we buy it. Additionally, Food Bank of Wyoming works with the Wyoming Department of Family Services uh, to distribute USDA commodities. Um, so the, this is a you know larger federal program where um, they purchase food from national growers and manufacturers, and then that food um, uh, we work with the state, and then that food comes to the Food Bank of Wyoming, and we actually distribute it. So one of those programs is the Emergency Food Assistance Program, and then we also have the uh, the Commodity Supplemental Food Program for older adults. And, you know, that one is geared specifically towards older adults. It's a, uh, a box. It's a recipe that has come up, um, that, that, that they come up with, and it has, you know, proteins and... Um, you know, fruits and vegetables and grains in it. And um, those boxes are actually pretty, they're pretty hefty. I mean, it's a pretty good amount of food. And we d- distribute those boxes to um, a certain group of people. Um, they're all above 60 every month. We also then have a robust grocery rescue program in all of our communities across the state. So, you know, we work with national partners, kind of like Albertsons, Safeway, Maverick, Sam's Club, Loaf and Jug, um, and Walmart. And we connect our local partners directly to those retail stores. And so then they can go and pick up food that is, um, again, nearing the end of its life or has been slightly damaged or perfectly good food that um, they can distribute out to um, to those people um, in need. And then we also um, we also purchase a lot of produce from national and local suppliers. Um, so our goal right now is to have about forty percent of the food that we distribute to be fresh produce. Because you know, I mean, it's the it's the best way that we can provide um, healthy, nutritious food um, to communities across the state. So you know that kind of gives you an idea of of where it all comes from. 
Um, but, you know, then you kind of ask, like, well, who are our partners? Who are our hunger relief partners? So our hunger relief partners are uh, food pantries, soup kitchens, senior centers, uh, maybe after-school backpack programs. So any community-based program that is distributing food on a, on a large scale to... Is it pretty diverse all year long? Yeah, we have a we have a there's there's a pretty wide range of food that we get. Um, you know, we try we we really focus on healthy foods. Um, but you know, within healthy foods, there's a lot of different things you can get. So you know, there's grains and um, legumes and produce and you know, like fruits and vegetables. And you know, of course, we have snack food. Everybody likes a little bit of snack food here and there. We have a lot of protein. We have eggs, dairy. So yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty wide range of food. Um, I think I looked yesterday morning and we had um, probably like over 100 items that were listed online for our partners to choose from. It's almost like in Europe they call it gleaning, um, kind of taking care of what would otherwise just go to waste. And so it definitely mm-hmm. serves that purpose too. So it's refreshing, even if you're not someone who is the you know benefactor of this, but just thinking that someone's taking care of all this excess food. Yeah. And relieving that we have excess food. We do. You know, there's a there's a there's a lot of food that is perfectly good to eat um, that may otherwise be disposed of. And so and that's why we we're placing a lot of emphasis on our grocery rescue program right now in communities, Um, you know, because grocery stores. You know, food has to be off the shelves a lot of times before it comes to the end of its life. Again, it's like perfectly good. It's, you know, within expiration dates and things like that. Um, But, you know, isn't it really wonderful that there are organizations that we can that we can partner with those retail stores that can go and pick that food up and then it get then get have it distributed to uh, those that can use it. Now, this question, I probably won't be surprised by your answer, but I'm going to ask. Anyway, um, how much did you see the need um, or food insecurity ramp up during the pandemic? So it the, the need increased quite a bit during the pandemic. And the pandemic was a unique event where there were a lot of people that they had to reach out and ask for help maybe for the first time. Uh, There's also, you know, there's been knock on effects from the pandemic. Um, You know, I mean, I'm sure that everybody listening has been to the grocery store and noticed that food costs a lot more and that fuel prices are up and and things like that and and inflation. And so that inflation has also caused a a, quite a few um, like an increase in need across the state and people seeking food assistance for the first time as well. Gosh, that's hard. Have have you noticed it tapering off or things getting better <clears throat> since? You know, the the increased need that we have seen um, since inflation has gone up has really stayed pretty steady right now. So there is a real increased need. And, you know, sort of um, I don't have like hard numbers yet, but anecdotally, there are a lot of folks that, that, that I've talked to that run pantries and soup kitchens and things. And so they're the number of households that they are serving have increased by anywhere from 50% to 100%. Um, and that kind of started last summer, and that has kind of remained stable. And are you guys able to meet the need, or is there ever a time where the warehouse is just completely empty? Well, we got, I'm going to, I will admit, uh, it got a little bit thin um, when there was with all the supply chain issues. So, you know, I mean, just as what you see happens in the grocery store, you know, we feel those same effects at the food bank, you know. So if there's like a run on toilet paper, we probably don't have any toilet paper either. Um, So, you know, a lot of things there was, um, you know, there was a really hard time finding uh, 10 cans. And so uh, the industries had to like kind of switch to putting things in pouches. And so there's been a lot of change in manufacturing practices like um, that happened as a result of the pandemic. Um, so there was a little while there where, you know, it like the shelves got a little bit thin, but we still feel that we were able to um, push out enough food 
um, to be able to feed everyone. Uh, we're in a much better place right now. Um, the warehouse is very full, and um, we have some exciting opportunities that are kind of coming up to um, hopefully purchase more uh, local food and to purchase continuing purchase more produce um, and also help some of the pantries and soup kitchens across the state be able to stock up, let's say, on food items that they need um, from you know, that maybe were depleted from COVID and then it's after effects. Have you noticed that there are trends across the state where some areas may have a greater need for food than others? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. It just depends on, it depends on the community, where it is, um, what's happening with the economy in that community, uh, if there are, like, how many resources there are, kind of things like that. So it does differ. Can you speak to how Casper stacks up? Against the lot of them? You know, really, Casper does a really great job of um, taking care of its own. Uh, there are a lot of services in Casper. Uh, and I would say that if you are not able to find what you need or get the resources that you need, uh, then you're not asking the right questions <laughs> because there are a lot of services here in Casper. Casper does a great. And, you know, I mean, I should say across the state, um, communities are care so much about the people that are in them. And, um, you know, I, I am, I have been consistently surprised and just delighted as I've been traveling across the state, meeting all of our partners, uh, how they are so creative in coming up with places that they can have pantries. I mean, you know, some of the pantries are in closets. Some of the pantries are in converted hallways. Some of them are in old classrooms. And so, you know, they've really done a great job of making sure that those people that do need food or do need to have access to a little bit more food have it. Oh, that's good to hear. And, awesome. Yeah. Go Casper. Yeah. Okay. Good. Now, what's the worst one? No, just kidding. <laughs> no. Just kidding. You don't throw anyone under the... I wonder, though, if the rural communities, maybe you see them struggle a little bit more just because there is um, maybe less people, less economy, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, that's what I was kind of talking to a little bit where it's like these, these um, you know, communities that are really taking care of their own creatively and using all of the resources that they can. There's just there's so many caring people across Wyoming. And so, you know, in every small community, there is a pantry somewhere. There is a way for people to access food somewhere. And, um, you know, and in, in communities that might need a little bit more support, uh, the Food Bank of Wyoming, what we have done, we've, we've really ramped up or increased our mobile pantry program across the state. And, you know, so pre-COVID, we had about four or five mobile pantries. And mobile pantries, you know, basically it's a truckload of food. Um, and we determine how much food kind of based on the population in the community. Community. And we have really targeted um, rural or remote communities that might not have as much support as other places. And that support, you know, meaning like their pantry is not open all the time or the pantry doesn't have enough space to store, uh, you know, a whole bunch of food or um, maybe they don't have enough people for, to volunteer, you know, kind of things like that. So we've tried to supplement with mobile pantries that show up once a month. And, you know, it's a big box of food um, with a whole bunch of um, produce that we um, and, you know, distribute these in fairgrounds and in church parking lots and, um, you know, across the state. So we have about 19 mobile pantries right now. I'm almost jealous because it seems like such like rewarding, fulfilling work. <laughs> oh, it's it's so much fun. And honestly, I mean, you know, I went to um, the Rollins Mobile Pantry um, last spring, and it's almost like a party. I mean, everybody, you know, we, you know, unload all the food and set it out. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of volunteers there, and they're excited. And um, clients, they line up in their cars and, you know, it's just really fun to meet everybody and hand out this food. And, um, you know, it's just it's kind of like a celebration of food. It's it was just a wonderful experience. 
This has surely got to affect you just at home when you're cooking and thinking about food. And are you, would you say that, or I guess, in what ways has it affected you? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's affected me. You know, honestly, I'm so much more conscious about waste. I'm so much more conscious about cooking what is in my refrigerator and cooking, you know, what's in my pantry. Um, but then I'm also very conscious of, um, you know, how we can utilize some of the food that we have in the warehouses or the food that we have in Wyoming to try and teach people um, how, how to um, incorporate them into their diet. So uh, one great example is um, through the USDA Commodities Program, we get a lot of lentils. Okay. So, you know, not everybody knows how to cook lentils. So we also have a really great partnership with um, Sensible Nutrition, which is a University of Wyoming extension program. And the uh, Sensible Nutrition, there is a, I think there's one in every county. And what they do is they actually help us create recipes for some of those food items that um, people might, might not know what to do with, like lentils. Um, and then they've also put together a program where they're providing Instapots. Um, you know, you have to go through a training and understand, um, you know, it's kind of a nutrition training and then also a, a training with the Instapot. Um, but it's a great program. So it's like you have not only the tools to cook the lentils, but then you come away with some really great recipes and um, understand how to use them because it's such a it's such a healthy, wonderful food. Um, but if you don't know how to cook it, then um, it's kind of hard to accept it. And vegetables, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they we help get us the out. the box, too. And yeah. I do a lot of smoothies and a lot of... Yeah. I'm not a great cook, I confess. So I'm like, all right, I'll just juice it. <laughs> I can drink anything. I just... <laughs> you know? Well, I'll put you in touch with the uh, Sensible Nutrition Recipe site because there's a whole bunch of great stuff on there. Okay. Because that's, I think, a challenge for people, and that might be cultural, too. I know um, when I was a kid and I grew up in Wyoming, it was very much meat and potatoes. But that brings me to my next point. Before I forget, potatoes. Potatoes are a big part of what's filling these boxes. Am I right? Yeah. No, we have potatoes, onions. You know, um, root vegetables and any sort of um, vegetable that has a longer shelf life. Um, So carrots, onions, potatoes, cauliflower, um, even things like kale. um, Those are all very desirable for us to purchase because we're able to bring it in and then get it to our partners on trucks and then they're able to distribute it. And we it has a better chance of, you know, lasting and getting to the client and then they have enough time to actually be able to cook it. I think it was in the fall I was reading that you guys had received just like so many pounds, I don't remember the number of potatoes from Idaho. Would you uh, do you think or would you say that you work pretty closely with the neighboring states too. So actually, so I'll I'll correct you a little bit. So we actually those were Wyoming potatoes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So no, it was very ex- ex- exciting. So that was also it was another great um, partnership through the University of Wyoming. So the University of Wyoming, their uh, extension programs, they have all of these great. Uh, like experimental farms and, you know, teaching farms and things like that, that they, they grow produce on. And so one of the, one of the farms, it's outside of Lingle and um, it's a big potato farm. And so they allowed us to come and dig up and bag as many potatoes as we could. And so uh, Sensible Nutrition actually helped us get a whole bunch of volunteers and we were able to bag 10,000 pounds of potatoes and bring them back to the Casper Distribution Center and then get them out to um, partners across the state. So, you know, we are always looking for partnerships like that. Um, You know, we love to uh, be able to feed people Wyoming grown um you know, produce or cattle or, you know, whatever. So we're always looking for opportunities like that. And then for protein, are you able to get a lot of meat to people or is it mostly protein in the form of beans and? No, we distribute, um, no, we distribute a huge amount of, of like chicken, beef, pork, um, you know, and it is, it is definitely something that, we could increase in Wyoming, um, but you know we are we are definitely working on that. Um, you know there's a there's a there's a few programs that through the USDA 
that um, they have grant funding where we can purchase more local items. And so what I'm really hoping to be able to do is to be able to purchase more Wyoming beef um, through that program. So we'll see. Fingers crossed that we get the grant. I'm going to make a radical suggestion. (laughs) We throw away so much in the animal harvesting process organ meats. And, you know, I'm just wondering if there's any way to access all of this. And for the people who don't want to eat it, I didn't either, but I've started eating more organ meats and it's delicious. It's good for you, but Mm -hmm. this goes back to the vegetable thing. It's still, you know, meat that's just going to waste. So it's my weird suggestion for the day. (laughs) It's a good suggestion. Um, You know, and that's why I think that uh, to your point, we try and have a a huge variety of foods so that people can select what they do want to eat. Um, we think that that's really important um, for, you know, for folks. Yeah. yeah, and certain people have diet restrictions and everything. Mm-hmm. So yep. is it easy to, I guess it's probably not easy, but can you accommodate those like gluten-free and? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, and, you know, some pantries, um, there's actually a, there's a wonderful pantry in Afton, Wyoming, and they have actually color coded their pantry shelves, shelves so that you can see what is gluten free, what is diabetic friendly, um, what has low sugar, low sodium, kind of all of those things. So um, that was a really cool and innovative way, I thought, to help people uh, shop based on their dietary needs. Is there anything we didn't really talk about or touch on that you wanted to? We didn't get um, into insects either, but I said I would only give <laughs> one weird suggestion. <laughs> this, this is um, a food source, okay? It is a food source. As far as global hunger goes, that's right. No, know, it's just like huge. Theory. Well, I think you know. I think that I think the important thing for Wyomingites to think about, and you know, I think Wyomingites are really wonderful, caring people that do think about their neighbors. And, you know, just to think about the fact that there are 11 percent of people and, and, and actually right now that it could be more. So those are those are stats from about 2020. Um, and as I was mentioning, the, there has been an increased need. But 11 percent of Wyomingites do su- suffer from um, food insecurity. So it's a it's a real thing that's happening in our state. Um, there are a lot of incredible organizations out there that are you know working on this. So, you know, what I, I encourage people to do that want to help. There's, you know, some easy ways that you can do that, actually. Uh, First of all is to donate to your local food pantry or soup kitchen. Um, And that can be a monetary donation or a food donation. Um, The other thing that you can do is volunteer. It takes a huge amount of people to distribute food across the state. And, you know, your local food pantry. um, We also have the the mobile pantries that I was talking about, 19 mobile pantries. That's a great volunteer opportunity um, around the state. And then, of course, you know, we also have volunteer opportunities here in our distribution center as well. Um, but you know, and I think that, you know, then the other thing too, is just, you know, pay attention. Like if it looks like your, um, you know, neighbor's not doing so well, like take them a casserole. Um, you know, like, like I kind of mentioned at the beginning, um, people that are food insecure are not necessarily food insecure all the time. They might be just going through a rough patch. You know, it could be anything, um, from, you know, maybe they had really expensive car repairs or maybe they've had a medical event and, you know, that could really put a strain on their budget. So, you know, Wyoming does a great job of taking care of each other. And I just encourage folks to continue to do that because there's a lot of people out there that are struggling right now. This has been Report to Wyoming, presented in the public interest by Town Square Media.